Hello. Good morning. Uh, as you know, there will be a city tour tonight. Okay. Yes. Guided by our friend Deli Boer. Uh, instructions for an hour simply to meet around six o'clock in front of the faculty uh, where we took the group for. Nice. Oh, we'll have some more details about the itinerary later. We'll make another announcement about it, perhaps at lunchtime. Yes. For those of you interested in participating in the writing workshop, please consult the uh, link to the writing workshop instructions, which was included to the general email yesterday, but you may also find the instructions in the book of abstracts. Because there's, there's an assignment, yes, for the workshop. You need to bring a, a little paragraph, yeah, but very short. And so please consult the instructions. It, the, part, the plan for our final party, closing party, sort of remains in the air. Yes. Uh, a number of different ideas that have been floated, but it kind of seems like holding a castle residence is not a bad plan because they're open to this idea, it's close to the campus, et cetera, et cetera. That plan will be finalized, though, I think, before the end of the day, end of the day today. Yeah. Uh, the workshop is something which is supposed to feed into the proceedings. And uh, as you know, we have a book of abstracts uh, currently, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it into a proceedings, which will be a full publication in which everyone's uh, abstracts will be included in their short biographies and changes to this, uh, to your submission to this proceedings. Uh, uh, can still be submitted. So there'll be like post post conference uh, editorial options for you, uh, during which you can add pretty much whatever you want, uh, specifically uh, recent publications, I think. So like one to three of your most recent important publications. And then uh, when we when we upload it, it would be a nice source uh, for citations uh, for all of us. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's the idea with the writing workshop as well. We'll produce a co-authored text experiment text, which is like a reflection on the proceedings of the conference. And this will be uploaded separately to Academia and ResearchGate as a co-author text, as well as included to the proceedings. So, yes, keep that in mind, but of course I'll say a little bit more about this at the workshop so. itself. It could rain tonight. I looked at Google and Google told me that it's not going to rain. It told me it's going to be partially cleft, but that's it. But it will be a little chilly, yes? 17, 16, even colder. So keep that in mind. But without further ado, uh, last year, the Chris Deva Society, of the Chris Deva Circle, I guess it's called, had their meeting in Bulgaria and so we, and the, uh, I applied to attend this and I went and presented, and I had the great fortune of meeting some excellent Bulgarian colleagues. In the group, I heard an unusual voice, a calm, calm voice, but one which just did not hesitate to speak the uncomfortable truths. We, we place a very high premium on that here at the International Semiotics Institute. So when I was tasked with selecting names to invite us keynote speakers, uh, her name was the first to come to mind, and her name is Professor Miglana Nikolshina. She works at Sofia University in Bulgaria. She has numerous uh, book publications. Uh, the only one I've read in, uh, in full is called uh, Matricide in Language, which is about Kristeva. And uh, today I think she'll be telling you a little bit more about that. So let us warmly welcome uh, Professor Miglana Nikolshina. So well, thank you so much. Uh, I decided I'll speak from, from here, and you are all there. But I hope I hope this uh, is not going to be a problem. Um, I, I'd like to begin by thanking Tyler personally, the organizers of, of this uh, amazing event. Uh, the people who spoke before me um, and um, introduced so much clarity, precision, 
um, into uh, the topic we are uh, presently discussing. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pity I've been trying to, to um, meet uh, Lenka Wojtyszkova ever since I heard her, <laughs> her paper a couple of days ago, but uh, somehow I, I could not succeed and I don't see her now. So she's obviously not here. But uh, what I'm going to, uh, to talk about uh, today is very much connected uh, to the paper she gave on... Uh, she's here? Okay, <laughs> good. I couldn't see. <laughs> so she gave a, uh, gave a paper uh, which uh, involved uh, Mesdol, uh, uh, Christopher and Jakobson, this type of uh, triangle. Um, <clears throat> Um, and um, um, she actually introduced uh, what uh, at some point I will refer to in my paper if I ever get there. Uh, my goodness, a lot is going on, but I refer to as the uh, zero degree of Christeva's um, discussion of metaphor. So, and then there is degree one, and then there is degree two, but uh, I believe what uh, uh, Lang uh, introduced in her, in her paper was. Uh, the zero degree, it's, um, it's the early uh, Christopher, not the earliest, but, uh, but still early enough. And uh, <clears throat> although it's a bit early for um, jokes, I decided to, to, to begin with a sort of anecdote, which is uh, connected to Nesvel, connected to sound, because we speak of images, and of course I'll be speaking of images that you're looking at some images here, <clears throat> but uh, um, sound was important in, in, uh, in Lenko's presentation. It, was, it is important for Christopher, it was very important for Jakobson, of course, and it will appear as an important aspect of what I'm going to uh, talk about today, uh, too. So there is a little bit of, of all of this in, in this anecdote. Um, <clears throat> And there is also the question of uh, non-translatability. By the way, is my voice coming through? Okay. So, uh, the year is 1932. And the Bulgarian poet Dora Gabe is in Prague uh, to give a talk on Bulgarian literature. At the time, there was a thing called newsreel. So, uh, so Nesvo saw a newsreel. And in the newsreel, there was a poster. And in the post, there was a photo of the camera. So you see, uh, I, I won't be able to, to discuss this too much, but we have this thing, image within image and within image, so it's a sort of a platonic, uh, a new platonic uh, uh, removal from, from, new, uh, from the original. So he saw the photo and he immediately decided he wants to meet this Bulgarian poet. He asked for help from the Czech Ministry of Culture. And there they were. Um, Dora Gabe was with an interpreter. She doesn't say in, in her memories, in her memoirs, um, uh, what language, from what language the interpreter was interpreting, but I assume it was somebody from the Bulgarian embassy, so probably in Bulgarian. Because the thing is funny in Bulgarian and English, it will, I don't think it would be that funny. So uh, they meet, and Dora Gabe, just to make things clear, um, she's Bulgarian poet, she, um, of course, spoke Bulgarian. Uh, she was the daughter of Russian Jews from um, around Odessa and her son, who fled to Bulgaria um, because of the regular persecution of Jews at the, at the time. So, so they moved to, to Bulgaria. She knew Russian. Uh, they kept speaking Russian in, in, in the home. Uh, she knew. Polish. She was a translator from Polish. She was an amazing, she did an amazing thing as a translator from Polish. And of course she knew, not of course, but she knew French because she graduated from a French university. So I'm saying all this because I, I think what she tells is Tanchi. It, it cannot be serious. And she, at this age she was 45-ish. We don't know exactly because she lived at a time when women could be a little bit secretive about uh, about their age. So at some point she said <laughs> she lost all the documents. So, <laughs> so we have no documents about when she was she was born. 
Imagine, let's say she was about 40. Five Nesbo was 32, let's say something like this. And then me, and Nesbo grabs her hands and begins to talk very quickly in Czech. So Dora Gabe turns to, to the interpreter and she says that I'll say it in English, but then I'll say it in Bulgarian because I think it's really funny in Bulgarian. And, uh, and she says, he must be saying something very poetic. And the interpreter said, I would rather call it pornographic. So, but what makes it really funny in Bulgarian is the rhyme, it's the sound. And because the also, either it's a little bit all the use of the word, or, or maybe perhaps, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, uh, Gabe changed uh, the. It's slightly unusual, the, the, the ending of, uh, of one of the words. But in Bulgarian, it is. To is a translator. I also call it a So it's this, uh, this sound which, uh, which I think it's, it's uh, really hilarious. And um, <clears throat> um, no metaphor yet, but it followed because uh, Nesco wrote uh, a novel dedicated to, to, to their experience together. She, uh, he called Gabe his Virgil and his Beatrice. Uh, he, he called the novel Jak Veitse Veitse, uh, like two drops of water, so he compared uh, the novel to, to, to drops of uh, uh, water, and he fulfilled his promise to her to have nothing uh, nothing pornographic in the novel, which uh, is a big feat for him because at the time he, he was first translating uh, André Breton's Nadia, second uh, he, was, uh, he was writing his own novel, Valéry and the Week of Wonders, I think, is the, is the translation, which is an absolutely erotic uh, uh, novel. So she, he was entering the surrealist stage, and there was a lot of, a lot of this. But, uh, but the novel about Dora Gabi is very much like um, Buñuel's um, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, because uh, it's always on the verge of something will happen, something like this, but no, something else happens, and, and this is never the case. Okay, so um, I'll come back to sound, because there, there is a little mystery about sound when we are uh, talking uh, about uh, uh, image and, and metaphor. And now I will begin my talk uh, proper with a summary. <clears throat> Clarifying, uh, 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 I had to clarify from the start that uh, they'll, uh, they'll probably not be able to uh, to speak uh, about all, all this stuff because uh, um, what I'll try to do is um, rather um, comprehensive, and I'll just be able to, to, to sketch it here. But uh, more or less, my uh, my task is to examine. Um, <clears throat> Christopher's specific perspective on metaphor as a concept, and more specifically, this would be uh, to see the light Christopher throws on the juncture of image and, and language. In, as she says, frequently metaphorizing, so metaphorizing as a process, not, not as a fixed thing. Uh, Actually, I won't be able to do too much about image. It's extremely interesting, but before we reach to this, uh, we have to do other things, and I'll, I'll, simply, uh, I'll simply sketch it. In, uh, to, to say it briefly from the beginning, so it's not lost uh, uh, in, in the end, image may appear actually as, a, as an obstacle on the way to language, on the way of drives towards the language. So this incessant transference of, uh, of energies from the drives to, to, to language, which is what really interests uh, Christopher. Um, an image may appear as a blockage, as something that's uh, uh, hindering uh, this process to, uh, to happen, but 
In other cases, uh, and it's the specific aspects that are important here, uh, image can be uh, facilitating uh, what's happening. And here she, she, has, she has a lot to say in various perspectives. For example, she would compare uh, the functioning of the icon in Orthodox Christianity and oppose it to, to Renaissance painting with its uh, figurative um, emphasis and, and so on and so forth. But we cannot go into this. Um, so, um, uh, what I'll try to do so, because there, as I already mentioned, stages in, in the uh, approach to metaphor. Um, is uh, contextualize this in, in the dynamic uh, of her um, overarching conceptual apparatus. So this will involve sketching uh, the genealogy and what is now accepted to be described as the terms um, in the development of some of Christopher's major terms. Um, and again, I'll, I'll need to emphasize that um, um, uh, sometimes uh, we cannot uh, uh, define every word with which we speak, but sometimes we need. I'll, I'll speak about signifiance. Signifiance. So in, in French, it is signifiance. Uh, this has been sometimes wrongly been uh, translated as signification, which is totally misleading. So it. it um, takes uh, discussion in, in different uh, directions. Uh, Lang uh, uh, took it as it is uh, translated, I believe, in the revolution in poetic uh, languages signifying practices, uh, which would be better. Uh, but I will do as other people also have done. Uh, I will use uh, the word signifiance uh, because it is uh, to have a specific take on the uh, production of science and the subject um, as a process. And then there will be the semiotic chorus, which uh, probably everybody has heard about. And then there will be something which is less discussed, but for me it is important because it emerges in, in her later work, and this is the concept of transubstantiation. Somebody already mentioned in one of the, of the, the discussions uh, uh, the um, um, this uh, Christian idea of um, um, wine becoming blood and, and bread becoming flesh. So this is precisely what transubstantiation um, initially means, but Kristeva takes it up from Proust, from Marcel Proust, and then she does certain things uh, uh, with it. Uh, uh, and some other terms may appear, but they are not Pivotal here, so I'm not going to discuss them or define them. If, if you need this, uh, we can do this later. I'll do as uh, Professor Stotter did uh, uh, yesterday, <laughs> because I think it was a very good idea. So at, uh, uh, at about 10 o'clock, uh, we'll have a question pause, so that you know, it doesn't become too heavy. Um, talking for an hour and a half, uh, or for you listening, it's easier to talk than to listen, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so we will have this uh, type of, of pause. Um, <clears throat> so, so um, but uh, to do this, I, I decided to, to, uh, uh, to um, you know, I shortened my, my task, although it will make it also longer. I decided to bring in these two artistic examples. And you see one of them um, uh, running for some time now. Uh, it comes from an exhibition of Bulgarian artist uh, Venceslav Zankov. And it, and it has this hypnotic title F in fire stands for fear. You know, I played a little bit with, uh, with this title and I realized that uh, there is something about it which is, first of all, it cannot be translated. So he thought about it in English. In Bulgarian, it's totally doesn't work. Uh, but it doesn't work even if it makes slight uh, um, changes in it. For example, I have a fear of flying, but if I say F in flying stands for fear, no, it doesn't work. 
it just doesn't work. Or if I say, of course, uh, if I say F in fire stands for horror, although this is quite horrible, as you can see, but uh, again, it, it, it doesn't work. On the other hand, at least to me, some totally meaningless, uh, 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 almost meaningless uh, replacement like F in flare stands for fear. So for me, or F in fair stands for fear. For me, it sort of works. So it seems it's not just the F in this thing, it's, it's um, the rhythm, it's the alliteration, it's, it's the thing is, oh, and then maybe there is the fire. And you'll see, there is, uh, as you can see, that, uh, I'll speak a little bit more later about the image of themselves. So the second example uh, <clears throat> comes from the third part of a video game. I have this scene. I, I play games. Um, I, I've been doing this since uh, 1989. Many of you were not born, <laughs> so I, I was already. I I I, I, sort of, I always say that I skipped cinema. Uh, so from from reading, from the passion for reading, I uh, moved straight to to, to to the passion for for playing. In cinema, of course, I've seen uh, thousands of films. Because everybody does, but it's never become this uh, addiction or as fit as, um, as reading and, and, and playing. So, um, uh, what I'll show a little later is selected images uh, uh, from, uh, from this game, which is huge. It's about uh, uh, whatever, I'll say a little bit uh, about it later. Um, and I'll mention here um, a friend uh, of our group, uh, a German theoretician, uh, Robert Matthias Erbeer, uh, who claims in a text which Bogdana Pascal over here translated, he claims in a, a text that uh, uh, video recordings cannot convey uh, what he terms the image action space. Um, so the continuum, the, the visual and the interactive in the space of the game, according to him, is lost if we show a recording. But I'll show a recording at the end, so that there will be there will be a recording running silently at, at some point. But um, he says it's uh, it's uh, it's not working. But uh, he believes what's working is uh, screenshots. And for me, it, you know, I'm happy with this. So we'll, we'll see some, some screenshots from, uh, uh, from the game for analysis. It is uh, certainly um, easier. Um, now, uh, what you've been seeing for some time is a selection from, from the catalog of this exhibition of uh, Zankov. Um, uh, I didn't see the exhibition itself, which took place, I think, in 2001. Um, I know much of uh, the artist's uh, other work. I, I like him a lot. Um, but, uh, um, um, as you can see, uh, there, was a, um, there was a performative aspect. Uh, to uh, to the exhibition, to the opening, um, because indeed this uh, this little girl you you saw was uh, uh, covered with gasoline and put on fire. So, and, and I asked him, so did did the did the figure survive? And he said, yeah, yeah, it, it survived. It, uh, so it, um, and. Um, well, it's, of course, I, I've made this selection to, to, to make my point, uh, but uh, later on we'll also see the catalog uh, as a call. Uh, so again, uh, let me emphasize, we're dealing with images of images. It's, it's, it's the catalog. Um, but if, if you look at uh, the selection or the, um, the catalog as a call, uh, somebody who is psychoanalytically um, how, how should I say, seduced, um, could um, unearth a lot of narratives. Fear of castration, woman, the sibling jealousy, this is because I know he has a sister, um, and I have a sister, so fantasy of the primal scene, gender trouble, um, and all sorts of strange uh, hybrid figures. 
um, uh, but uh, and behind all this uh, more kind anxieties related to the earliest separations uh, that set the speaking being on the way to, to subjectivity. So Christopher did a lot of her work on, on this stage. However, these narratives are not articulated by the artist. And uh, because he's not easy to, to talk to, I, I tried to ask some questions, he answered whatever he wanted. Uh, but I'm sure he would be mad if uh, I insist too much on, on some sort of psychoanalytic readings of, uh, of, what, of what he did. Nevertheless, he says uh, that uh, this exhibition is based to a large extent on fragments of dreams and, and, stuff, uh, and stuff like this. Uh, in all cases, the narratives, whatever narratives we come up with, uh, are not part of his work. Um, and later, um, we'll see uh, 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 the, the full thing, all, all the images from the show. And so now we uh, will go to, to the images from uh, the Mans effect. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, because I, I, I did not, uh, uh, okay. Here we have a story, and it, it goes like this. Shepherd, a woman in these images, but it could be a man, in various choice, is the protagonist in a battle between advanced organic galactic civilizations and powerful and mysterious evil machines. In the third and so far, the, uh, so far the last part of the game, Earth is under attack and Shepard tries to rescue a boy. You can see it in the very first image with playing with a model of a, a, a ship. Uh, the boy runs away from her. Subsequently, Shepard sees the vehicle uh, which picks up the boy, but the vehicle gets destroyed. From this point on, in key points of the game, Shepard keeps dreaming that she is running in a dark forest of dead trees, trying to reach the beginning child, and here we have something which games can do. So up to this point, you move very quickly, you can jump, you can do things, and suddenly in, the, in this situation, movement becomes terribly difficult, it's really like in a dream, you cannot uh, really advance, and when you finally uh, catch up with uh, 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 with a boy, um, he, he burst into flames. He burst into flames. In the last of these dreams, she also sees herself uh, uh, burning with him. I think there was an image like this. <clears throat> in the finale of the game, she is confronted by the child in a shimmering energy form. You must have seen it. Uh, he has been transformed into, as the saying goes, the ghost in the machine. So there is a conversation, an important conversation at the end of the game with this child which has been transformed. So later on I will run without sound uh, this final scene, scene with, with a male shepherd for, for a change. So unlike the case with Zankov, there is an ample narrative behind the mass effect image of the burning child. The images of cross uh, differ uh, drastically, they differ artistically, this difference is significant, it inflects my analysis inevitably. Uh, there are further complications with Zankov, we are looking at photographs of a sculpture made out of plaster, which was covered with, as I said, and set on fire, real fire. With mass effect, the images of the burning child are from cutscenes a problem in video game analysis, I, I cannot really go into this, but it's, uh, I, I find that uh, uh, cutscenes cut deprive the player from uh, uh, the inter interactive aspect uh, of the game, but I, I believe that it's precisely this deprivation which becomes meaningful, especially in this case, it's really utilized very well. Um, so, um, in both cases, uh, uh, we might say the child survives uh, because uh, in one case it is transformed, in the other case it, it doesn't change, maybe a little bit black because of the burning, but you know, it, uh, it survived. Um, in, we could say that in both cases the burning child uh, is connected to other fiery images, 
images of monstrosity, a terrifying beast uh, in the case of Zankov with his, if you remember, the dogs with their bunny. Uh, uh, I think something like candles on, on their backs. And, uh, uh, and But also the terrifying machine, which is spewing uh, fire. So they emit fire and, um, uh, and now they appear as shapeless, now they're uh, having some shape. So it's again like things taken from a dream. Uh, these are not trivial details, the details they will work in the background while well, we focus on the image of the burning child. One striking similarity is that in both cases, the children are not represented as, uh, as uh, being in pain. Um, so Zankov's girl possesses a Buddha-like posture and concentration, I believe, uh, uh, which could also be described as the posture of an unfolding embryo. So we have the embryo and then the embryo sort of unfolds and then it is put on fire. Um, Mm. And of course, the flames from time to time render the, this girl look sinister. This looks it's a bit terrifying. Uh, the boy's bright eyes continue to, to stare at us through the flames, maybe accusing, maybe sad, maybe knowing, maybe compassionate. Um, is the, the gay saying perhaps I cannot help you because it, it is Shepherd who makes help uh, in, in, in these dreams? Um, um, the way you could not help me. Um, in any case, the, the fire that consumes uh, the kids is not the kind of fire that causes pain uh, to the one burning, uh, so it's obviously a metaphorical fire. It's, it's, it stands for something else, and it, it's, uh, it's a metaphor. So what is the meaning uh, of, uh, uh, of this metaphorical fire? It might seem obvious in the case with Shepherd. The burning child in, is an expression of Shepherd's guilt for being alive while the child is dead. Or to go one step further, it symbolizes Shepherd's premonitions of the end of humanity and organic civilizations. Or to get one step uh, uh, further, it points towards the human child's cleansing of its material form. We could think here of the fire in the Buddhist fire sermon, which appears in Eliot's uh, The Wasteland. So uh, uh, the child gets cleansed from its material form. And uh, we spoke about transhumanism a couple of days ago, and so um, we see this again in some form. And, and his transformation into the energy form, Shepard will encounter at the end. So uh, actually, we, we could shift our interpretation of the fire with the uh, advancement uh, of the narrative. Uh, trying to interpret Shepard's dream uh, as a ma metaphor takes us, therefore, to uh, various levels of the game's narrative. Zankov, as pointed out, on the other hand, does not provide the narrative. Uh, however, uh, the artist does offer some sort of explanation in the title of his exhibition. Um, a title that, uh, uh, by the way, makes the fire central to the whole exhibition, although only certain figures are on fire, not everything there. Um, so there, uh, here we come to, to the F in fire stands for fear. Uh, I decided to have a, maybe I should have gone on because it was really funny, but I had a little dialogue with uh, Chad GPT, uh, with the GPT-4 about, about this verse. So I said, I really asked him, uh, uh, what is its explanation of uh, how it would explain the, the um, uh, effect of the verse. And he, uh, I had a lot of clever stuff to say about alliteration and, you know, and, and then I said, what about rhythm? And, and it said, there is no rhythm. I said, yeah, yeah there is. That you are not pronouncing F as you should be. So you should say F or maybe F. But you know that. that, that. So, and, and, and then it said, ah, it's trukaik. And, and then I stopped. <laughs> and, uh, maybe I should have gone on. Uh, but, uh, so, but the, it is there. It, there